earlier you were drawing certain parallels between medieval philosophy and modern philosophy. I mean, you, and, uh, you've given us another one now with interest in the revival of interest mm. in the ontological argument. You were saying earlier that um, logic in the Middle Ages was language-centered. Uh, 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 well, yes, to, to a large degree, logic and language-centered, and that's again true now, though it wasn't true for much of the period in between. And there seems to be another um, way in which philosophy now can be likened to philosophy then, and that is that after a long period in which moral philosophers uh, were not concerned with specific problems of living, but were concerned with the analysis of logical arguments and concepts and so on, they are now coming back to being concerned with what philosophers call first-order problems. Now, that was so in the Middle Ages, wasn't it, for most of the time? This, again, is a fairly recent change in the Anglo-American philosophy that you and I were brought up in. Um, I think at the time when we were starting philosophy, we would be told that the, it wasn't the task of the moral philosopher uh, to tell you whether it was ever permissible to tell lies or whether there was anything wrong with adultery or what were the criteria by which you would decide whether a war was being justly and fairly waged and so on. Uh, these were thought to be matters of importance, no doubt, but not the business of the philosopher. The philosopher's task was a second-order task. It was to analyze the language and concepts which we use to make these first-order decisions. Whereas in the last decade, I think there has been a great swing of interest back to the real live moral questions as being something uh, which concerns philosophers as philosophers, not just as citizens or moral human beings. There's been an enormous input from philosophers into questions of medical ethics, for instance, questions of the preservation of life and of such questions as when it is right to turn off lights of life support systems, uh, whether it's right to experiment on embryos and so on. After all, in this country, it was a philosopher, Mary Warnock, who chaired the committee of inquiry into that. Uh, there has been, in particular, um, uh, an interest in the relationship between moral philosophy and the waging of warfare. I'd like, to I'd like us to take this up because you yourself have written a book recently about nuclear deterrence and one question to which you have to address yourself, which is central to, to your book, is are, you know, are there any imaginable circumstances in which nuclear war would be justified? And you refer to the whole medieval tradition of discussion of the just war and you say in your own book that you think that any intelligent person ought to take an interest in these arguments. Can you tell us something about what they were? Yes, the, the theory of the just war is something of which there's the germ in the Middle Ages in Aquinas and in later thinkers. It gets more developed just after the uh, end of the Middle Ages in the post-medieval scholastics. But it is the question about in what circumstances uh, is it morally right to wage war uh, and if you go to war, uh, what moral constraints are there uh, on the way in which you wage war, on what you choose as targets, what you do with prisoners and things like that. Now, the, the theory of the just war uh, is a theory in the middle between two opposing views. On the one hand, there's the pacifist view that there's no such thing as a just war. All wars are immoral and wicked, no matter how noble the causes are for which they're waged. On the other hand, there's what you might call the view that no wars are unjust. That is, that though war is a terrible thing, once you get into war, there are no moral rules at all. The only moral imperative is just to win the war by the most effective possible means. Now, the uh, tradition of the just war says, no, neither of those are true. There are some values that are more important than life itself, and therefore uh, values for which you can uh, legitimately make war. But within war, there have to be constraints. Uh, the, there have to, has to be a, a good reason for going to war. The, the values for which you go to war have to be ones really important enough to defend in that way. And when you go to war, there are constraints on what you choose as targets. There must be no uh, deliberate killing of the innocent, whether by the innocent you mean civilians not involved in, in the war-making or um, ex-combatants who are now prisoners and so on. Now, it's very interesting, I think, that this medieval just war tradition lies behind two of the most significant contributions to the debate recently about nuclear weapons. In this country, uh, the Church of England's book, The Church and the Bomb, uh, and in the United States, 
uh, the pastoral letter of the American Catholic bishops uh, on the use of nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence. Much of what you've been saying refers, though you didn't mention the name, to the work of Thomas Aquinas. Isn't it the case that Aquinas is now, as it were, the official philosopher of the Roman Catholic Church? I think we've just about come to the end of the period in which it, that could have been said. Oh. Uh, before the 19th century, though he was held in enormous respect, I don't think he was in any way the official philosopher of the Roman Catholic Church. He was perhaps the official philosopher of the Dominican order, but that's only a small part of the Catholic Church. Then in the late 19th century, Pope Leo XIII uh, wrote an encyclical letter giving him a special place in the teaching of philosophy and theology in Catholic seminaries and universities. Since the Second Vatican Council, I have the impression that the uh, hold of uh, Aquinas on Catholic institutions uh, has become much looser, and he's been replaced largely by other philosophers, I think not always by philosophers who are... Um, not deserve, always better. Not, 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 not always better, but yeah. they, I think, in fact, the reputation of Aquinas in the non-Catholic world has enormously gained from the fact that he's now no longer seen as just the spokesman for a party line. And um, particularly in the United States, there's a growing interest in his work by people who aren't Catholics, perhaps aren't even Christians at all, who are just impressed by the sheer philosophical genius of the man.